Welcome to episode 5 of module 7 infectious disease. We'll be finishing up inquiry question 2 and looking at inquiry question 3, how does the immune system respond to exposure to a pathogen? Our syllabus reference for the video, we will look at responses to the presence of pathogens by assessing the physical and chemical changes that occur in the host cell, investigate and model the innate and adaptive immune system, and explain the immune system's response after primary exposure to a pathogen, including innate and acquired immunity. Our learning intentions for today's video, we will define the terms antigen, antibody, phagocytosis, plasma cell, memory B cell, memory T cell, T helper cell, cytotoxic cell, and suppressor T cell. Distinguish between innate and adaptive immune response, and explain in detail the physical and chemical changes that occur during the immune response. So let's first look at the innate response. The innate immune response encompasses the first and second lines of defense. It is rapid and non-specific to the pathogen entering the body. The first line of defense in the immune response is a collection of physical and chemical barriers that act to prevent pathogens from entering the body or to quickly eliminate them if they do gain entry. Physical barriers include the skin and mucous membranes that line the respiratory, digestive and reproductive tracts. Chemical barriers include saliva, tears and stomach acid. An antigen is any foreign substance that enters the body that triggers an immune response. If an antigen surpasses the first line of defence, the second line will kick in. Two parts of the second line of defence include phagocytosis and inflammation. Phagocytosis is a crucial process in the immune system where certain cells, macrophages and neutrophils, types of white blood cells, work together to fight infections. When a pathogen breaches the first line, it releases chemicals that signal phagocytes, macrophages, to travel to the site of infection. The phagocyte recognises the foreign invader through receptors on its surface and wraps its cell membrane around the pathogen forming a sac-like structure called a phagosome. The phagosome fuses with lysosomes, which are small organelles containing digestive enzymes. The enzymes help to break down the pathogen into smaller pieces, essentially digesting it. The remaining non-digestible material is expelled out of the phagocyte. The inflammatory response is like the body's superhero reaction to an injury or infection. Imagine it as the body's way of saying, danger, let's fix this. When an injury such as a cut or a splinter occurs, bacteria attempt to enter the body through the break in the skin. Cells at the injury site release histamines as a signal to white blood cells to help fight the immune response. Blood vessels will dilate to increase the blood flow and the blood vessel walls become more permeable to allow the white blood cells to slip through the walls to the site of infection. This process results in swelling, redness, heat, tenderness and pain on the surface of the skin. And lastly, let's look at the adaptive immune response. Before we deep dive into the third line of defence, it is important we understand the key players involved. B cells and T cells, also called B and T lymphocytes, are types of white blood cells involved in the third line of defence. Both cell types form in the bone marrow, however T cells will mature in the thymus and the B cells will stay in the bone marrow to mature, hence their names B and T. So let's start with B cells. Plasma B cells are actively involved in the production of antibodies or immunoglobulins. Antibodies are types of proteins that help to neutralize evading pathogens. Memory B cells form after the initial exposure to an antigen. They are specific remembering cells, so if the body encounters the same pathogen again, the immune response will be faster in producing antibodies to fight. Now let's look at T cells. There are four key players. The first is helper T cells. They will initially recognize antigen presenting cells that are located on the surface and trigger both B cells and T cells. Cytotoxic killer cells, as you can guess, are responsible for directly killing the infected or abnormal cells. They release cytokines to induce cell death in the target cells. 
Suppressor cells, as their name suggests, are involved in suppressing and switching off the immune response when the body has finished fighting the infection. And lastly, memory T cells, similar to B memory cells, in that they have memory-like properties that aid in fighting infection if re-exposed. Okay, let's dive into the third line of defense. The third line of defense is known as the adaptive or acquired immune response. This is because it develops over time. It is also highly specific to each pathogen that enters the body. This line of defense is divided into two parts, the humoral and cell mediated immunity. The humoral involves all the activities of the B cells and the cell mediated involves all the activities of the T cells. The image on your screen is a basic model of how the third line of defense works. In your classrooms, you'll probably create more detailed models to help consolidate your understanding of the immune response. Recall from the second line of defense that phagocytosis is the process by which a phagocyte, a type of white blood cell, engulfs a pathogen. The specific phagocyte that does this is called a macrophage. When the macrophage engulfs the pathogen and digests its material, it will display its contents on the surface. These are referred to as antigen presenting cells. A T helper cell contains binding sites on the surface of the cell that are specific to the antigen. Think of it like a key and a lock. A specific key is made for a specific lock. The same applies here. When the T helper cell binds with the antigen presenting proteins on the surface of the macrophage, it will trigger the production of plasma B cells and cytotoxic T cells. The plasma B cells will secrete antibodies which are specific to the antigen presented to neutralize and eliminate. Again, one antibody for one type of antigen. You can see why this is a highly specific immune response. On the other side, cytotoxic T cells begin killing the infected cells. This is all happening at the cellular level. At the organism level, a person's body may produce a high fever, increased mucus production, increase in urination and waste elimination, vomiting, etc. These are all the signs indicating that your body is actively fighting the infection. The symptoms begin to ease when your body has finished fighting the infection. Back at the cellular level, the T suppressor cells are attempting to switch off the immune response. Your memory B and T cells have sat back and watched the show, taking in how the body has responded and stores this information if reinfected with the same pathogen in the future. Now that was a lot to take in, I know. This is why modeling process such as this helps us to consolidate your understanding. In the last part of this video, I want to briefly outline the structure of antibodies. Now, as mentioned previously, antibodies are secreted by the plasma B cells to neutralize the antigen. They are highly specific, meaning one type of antibody per one type of pathogen. They are a Y-shaped protein consisting of two heavy arms that are long and large, and two light arms that are short and small. At the tip of the arms are variable or V regions that have antigen binding sites responsible for recognizing and binding to specific antigens. And that is the end of episode five. Thank you for watching.